Final Fantasy X-2. A weirdly divisive title. The Final Fantasy that makes some people froth at the mouth and write a several hour long video essay on why this game is the worst game ever. Not me though, I like this game actually, but that doesn't mean I don't have a lot to say about it. Because while I enjoy the game, it also doesn't really feel like a Final Fantasy game somehow. Not in the way Final Fantasy XIV, obviously, doesn't feel like a regular Final Fantasy game either. So let's talk about that. Hello and welcome back to the Bird channel where we talk about whatever I want and I stream on twitch.tv slash Jinzy. Today we're going to talk about both Final Fantasy X and X2, because I can't really talk about the latter without the first. That means this video will have spoilers for both games, because we're going to compare stories and characters quite a bit. And as Final Fantasy X is my favorite Final Fantasy of all time, if you haven't played it yet, here's my recommendation that you do. It's also just helpful to know the story beforehand. Now, without further ado, gather round the fire and let me tell you a tale. Final Fantasy X started development before Final Fantasy IX was even finished at all, and came with a hefty development budget of over $32 million. But as the PlayStation 2's first Final Fantasy, and the first installment with full voice acting and largely 3D backgrounds, the game was set up for success. Alongside Seven and the two online games, it became the most successful Final Fantasy in terms of profit ever made. So it wasn't entirely surprising that the studio wanted another one. They dropped the ball on that for seven, and they weren't going to make the same mistake twice, making X the first Final Fantasy with a direct sequel. X's original writer, Kazushige Nojima, wasn't necessarily happy with that, especially as the ending to X2 would be a happy one. He felt it was wrong for the story. If you want to know exactly how strongly he felt about this story having a happy ending, I'd like to point you towards a novel he wrote after the fact that continued the Final Fantasy X-2 storyline. It was called Aen no Daisho, The Price of Eternity, and sees Yuna and Titus transported to a besaid of the past. Uh, just to recap a few points while using only words that the YouTube algorithm will allow me to use, there's now a a wrestling together in bed method of creating new aeons. Titus is literally exploded by a fake blitz ball and then brought back by a god who tells Yuna he'll lock away her memories of seeing him literally explode in front of her eyes, his head doing a shocked little flyby before she loses consciousness. But if Titus ever realizes he's dead, he'll disappear because he's now basically a summoning created by Yuna. The book also lingers strangely on breasts and reveals a whole fun slave plot for the Albed. Even better, he also created an audio drama where Sin returns and Yuna and Titus fight about Titus possibly cheating on her and Yuna possibly seeing another man. Yeah. Nojima really looked at Final Fantasy X-2's happy ending and said, Absolutely not. How dare you get those cheerful faces entirely out of my sight, hooligans. Hey, so I'm thinking about making a game with a happy end. What? A game? With a happy end? Sounds terrible. It'll be a continuation of your writing. What? Yeah, I figured we could embrace the theme of change. What do you mean? Happy! You know, bring Titus back so they can- Unacceptable! Really? I, I- I'm writing a new book to give them both trauma! I haven't even told you the story- Titus gets blown to pieces! What? Everyone is having naked wrestling matches! Oh, oh, oh hold on now. If I'm sad, everyone's sad. I'm calling a therapist. Thankfully, everyone, including Japan, hated all this added content and we're going to ignore it exists because life feels better that way, more joyful somehow. Producer Yoshinori Kitase and director Motomu Toriyama specifically wanted the game to embrace the concept of change that Final Fantasy X began and to create a more upbeat tone. You know, the thing Nojima tried to undo with his novel, so things went ahead as planned and much faster than an entirely new Final Fantasy would, because this time 
they already had most of the assets available. Character models, environments, enemies, it was all there. The game's development began in late 2001 and was completed in early 2003. It's basically a year. And Final Fantasy X II, while it kept most of the characters and places intact, changed quite a bit about the gameplay. So let's start with that. I'll do my best to keep it brief, but I will very likely fail in that endeavor. Final Fantasy X has the standard setup of seven characters in the main cast, with a healthy mix of every stereotype available, as introduced by Final Fantasy VII. Quick melee attacker, slow heavy melee attacker, all-rounder, ranged physical, mage, utility thief, and summoner. Especially around the start of the game, you'll end up switching into their assigned stereotypes a lot, because only your ranged physical can kill the flyers reliably, only your mage can deal with elemental creatures well, and swapping out is easy because you can do so at will at any time during combat, and it doesn't even cost you a turn. Final Fantasy X-2 instead gives you the three girls, and that's it. But they're all capable of being whatever you need them to be because of the dress sphere system. Dress spheres are basically equipable Final Fantasy jobs. Thief, White Mage, Dark Knight, that sort of thing. They each have their own abilities and appearance, and said appearance even differs depending which of the girls equips them. While the abilities are largely universal, there are a few dress spheres that have different skills per girl, like the trainer and mascot spheres. Practically, this means you'll never really see any of your main party members fall behind in Final Fantasy X II. Whereas in Final Fantasy X, unless you swap the entire party every single fight, you're going to see some favorites rise to the top pretty quickly. And if one of them isn't Auron, we can't be friends. In terms of story and character progression, the smaller party actually creates a few problems. But when it comes to streamlined combat, I prefer it over the bigger, swap-heavy party. You're still technically swapping in party members in 10 2 they're just all available in the same body. If you've played Final Fantasy XIV, where you can swap in and out of any job at will, it's like that. And I love that. I never felt like I was neglecting anyone, I could always use the right skills for the job, and it added an extra layer of tactical decisions in terms of setup as well. Because the way you swap dress spheres is through garment grids. Garment grids are small slabs with nodes in them of varying amounts. Those nodes hold dress spheres. You start out with a standard one called First Steps, which has six nodes, but there are a ton of different grids to find throughout the game, each with different bonus stats. To switch to a different dress sphere, all you have to do is open the garment grid during combat and select a sphere adjacent to the one you've equipped. For example, I'm in the middle here, so I can choose any of the dress spheres available, because they're all connected to the center. But in this case, I can only choose to equip one other sphere. But how you choose to swap spheres and how you set up your nodes in the first place depends on the fight completely. You might have noticed some colored circles on the grid already. Those are gates. When you swap spheres that are connected by a line with such a gate on it, you activate the gate. And gates can be anything from breaking the damage limit or guaranteed critical hits to a simple boost to your stats. Because of that, if you're not grinding out the levels to overpower your opponents, it's important to take a look at what the gates on each grid do and what dress spheres you'd want to use during more difficult fights. In Final Fantasy X, you don't have to make that decision. The only thing that will affect your combat prowess outside of skills used during combat is your level. So let's talk about that. Levels in Final Fantasy X are gathered through AP, ability points, that you earn at the end of combat. Gather enough AP and you gain a sphere level that you can spend on the sphere grid. It's basically a set of connected nodes that represent abilities and status upgrades. The sphere levels are used to move around that network while using different items you pick up during combat to activate the nodes themselves. You can fill the entire thing top to bottom, even changing the usually empty nodes into stat nodes if you like. Which means that every single character in your team can eventually have all the exact same abilities and stats. In Final Fantasy X-2, you do level the girls themselves, but you don't assign their levels. They're just standard 
predetermined stat upgrades. Instead, what you'll be grinding is abilities. Each dress sphere has their own abilities and by using the job in combat, you gather points that eventually allow you to learn a new skill for that job. I'll get back to you on the stat cap thing later because there are other characters in Tantu that can certainly make it to that cap. So, what does combat actually look like in each game? Pretty straightforward in Final Fantasy X. You find a monster, you pick whatever combination of characters is their direct counter, and you leave. If it's a boss, you swap out your entire team first and make sure they perform an action for some extra levels, but largely, you'll gravitate towards a favorite team that you'll teach abilities to fill the gaps of team members you enjoy using less. If you don't like using Yuna, you teach Auron some white magic, because everyone likes Auron. Final Fantasy X-2 instead actually seems to have slightly easier combat at the start, but some of their endgame enemies really require you to think about your strategy. So your usual encounter will involve a few magical girl transformations to swap out your dress spheres, and then you start chaining. Because while Final Fantasy X has a CTB system, conditional turn-based battle, Final Fantasy X-2 went back to ATB, active time battle. The difference is in waiting. Final Fantasy X lets you wait and consider your move at your leisure during each turn, while Final Fantasy X-2 has everyone's turn progress even if you haven't made a decision yet, and turns can happen simultaneously. This is where chain damage comes into play. When you attack an enemy and immediately attack again with another character, their attacks will chain and deal more damage. The higher the chain, the higher the damage. If you line up your whole team and use a gunner ability to rapidly land a bunch of hits, for example, your other two girls could swing in some heavy hits at the top of the chain to deal massive damage. You can also interrupt enemies that are easily staggered, completely preventing them from taking an action at all if you time your attacks well enough. Honestly, it's very satisfying when you can pull it off. One thing Final Fantasy X-2 does lack, of course, is summons. They don't exist in this world any longer, so that's a Final Fantasy X exclusive. It feels a little weird at first, but they technically have their own version of summons that sort of combines their ultimate weapons as well. I love collecting ultimate weapons in any Final Fantasy game, and X has some very annoying ones to pick up. To complete everyone's most powerful weapons, you have to win not one, but two pretty tough chocobo races, and win a bunch of Blitzball matches, a minigame in 10. One of the more infamous requirements is standing in a single area of the game, pressing X whenever you see the screen flash white. 200 times in a row, without missing a single one. I recommend you press pause and do them in batches of 10 or 20 to save your own sanity, but either way, you will develop some level of eye strain, and all you'll have to show for it is a silly little doll. Finally. My eyes fell out of my sockets, but it's worth it. Hey, I haven't seen you in a while. Where have you been? Staring at a screen for hours on end. Oh, that sounds exciting. It wasn't. It was the worst thing I've done in years. So why'd you do it? This doll. Oh, yes. No, I see it. I see it. You want to get it? I want to get the eye strain doll. Final Fantasy X-2 instead has ultimate dress spheres. One for each girl with a whole different setup and they behave much like summons would. They're also extremely easy to obtain. You just have to walk over to the place that has the item or talk to someone a few times for the most part. Each has an upgrade item that requires a little more work, but nothing remotely as upsetting as dodging lightning bolts. You can only summon a character's ultimate dress fair after you've gone around the entire garment grid you've currently equipped. So a lot of magical girl dress changes. There's even a specific garment grid available with only two nodes on it, so you can use the ultimates more easily. Once summoned, you have your main body and two side bodies to control that replaces the rest of the party. They're very powerful, but with the right setup, not necessarily the most powerful dress sphere. I would argue that's the mascot dress sphere, obtained by completing all the side stories perfectly in one playthrough, or by defeating the Youth League Tournament, a pretty tough combat challenge. But the dress sphere has very high stats and powerful abilities, as well as the option to learn Ribbon, immunity from practically all status ailments. And while Final Fantasy X allows you to quite literally cap out your entire team to 255 on every stat, 
Final Fantasy X II doesn't. In fact, you can't really touch the girl's stats at all, save for accessories, of which you have two on each person. And while that might seem like one up on Final Fantasy X, it generally means you just have less slots. Final Fantasy X's accessories could have four slots on them to fill as you pleased. Final Fantasy X II accessories have static effects, one per accessory. If you want to break your damage limit, you'll have to waste a slot on that, unless you have a garment grid available with it instead. What that means is that, in the end, your Final Fantasy X II team will never be as strong as your team in X. Not that it matters too much, because both games technically get outclassed by powers outside of their personal control. If you've played X, you've probably heard about Yojimbo. Yojimbo is a summon you don't have to collect, but I would recommend that you do, because Yojimbo comes with the Zanmato ability. Here's how that works. Yojimbo holds a certain level of love for Yuna in his heart. Depending on how much he loves Yuna, he'll use one of a set of abilities each time we pay him money. If you pay him only a little, he'll use Daigoro, his dog. He won't even dirty his blade himself. This means he'll dislike you more after the fact. Next is Kozuko, some throwing knives. He still won't use his actual blade, but he won't actively dislike you for it. If you pay him enough, however, he'll use Wakizashi. He'll like you more after using this ability. In doing this, after each fight, Yojimbo will hopefully like you a little more, depending on the abilities. And eventually, if he likes you enough, it becomes relatively easy to trigger his final and most powerful ability, Zanmato. He'll use this ability if he doesn't like you too, you just have to pay him way more money. It kills anything and everything, I really mean that. As long as Yuna can be in the party, Yojimbo Zanmato is an option. Random Encounter? Zanmato. Dark Aeon? Zanmato. Ultimate Final Boss Penance? Zanmato. Kefka? Zanmato. The solution to all your problems in Final Fantasy X, at least from the point you can obtain him, is Yojimbo and his sword for hire. In Final Fantasy X 2, it is not. It is a mushroom. Mushroom Cloud, the Destroyer. Why? What makes this little shroom so special? Why not Almighty Shinra? And how does this mushroom make its way into my party? Well, the international version, which is also the HD version in general, comes with the Creature Creator. It's a little capture game akin to the capturing game you had in Final Fantasy X. Don't worry, we'll go over those too. You talk to Shinra, the little dude on your ship, and he'll take you into a separate window that allows you to use various capturing devices to catch fiends from all over the world. Once you've caught a fiend, you can use it in your party as a regular party member. Small fiends take up one space, medium two, and large all three. You can level them as usual, but you can also feed them accessories or items to increase their stats. Which, yes, means that while you can't max out the main characters in terms of stats, you can do so for fiends. You need to use the right dress spheres and swap around during combat to utilize your gates in order for your girls to be as powerful as they can be. But your fiends eventually come with maxed out stats on top of their accessories, as well as the ability to simply learn passive abilities like damage and HP break. But that's not why the mushroom is so powerful. It's only part of it. The mushroom is powerful because of pernicious powder. Pernicious Powder is an ability available to the Mushroom Cloud and the Mushroom Cloud only, and it can inflict Petrify, Sleep, Darkness, Silence, Poison, Confusion, Berserk, and Stop. But the most important thing it does is lower the enemy's magic and strength levels by 10. No matter what. That doesn't sound like a very high number, but it really is. It also makes them itchy, which is just funny to me. This cannot be blocked, even by the ultimate superboss, Major Numerus, Outer Plane Envoy. The powder will absolutely destroy any stats your opponent has, and your little mushroom can also learn Ultima, so it sits there, menacingly, 
powdering your enemy into being a very soft friend indeed, while chain casting Ultima. It's ridiculous and amazing. A mushroom is Final Fantasy X-2's greatest warrior. Final Fantasy X's greatest warrior is a dude and his dog saving for retirement. Yojimbo could probably still Zanmato Mushroom easily though, let's be honest. Most Final Fantasy games will have mini-games of some kind. Final Fantasy X was no exception. Let's go through all of them very quickly. Don't worry, there's not that many, and the majority reward you with ultimate weapons, so none are ever mandatory save a single event. Blitzball, the big one. You get a sports team to play ball with, underwater. This minigame rewards you with one character's ultimate weapon and its upgrades, as well as several overdrives, Final Fantasy X's version of limit breaks, very powerful abilities. It's easy once you know the trick, even with your starting team, but it soaks up a lot of time if you want the best rewards. A single Blitzball match is part of the main storyline, though. Lightning Dodger, you already know. Press X when the screen flashes white 200 times for the final reward. The most fun you've never had. Butterfly Catching, run around dodging red butterflies while catching blue butterflies on a timer. Very quick, pretty easy. Chocobo Racing, there are two places to do this. One lets you race against another character while catching balloons and dodging low-flying birds. The other has you race against another chocobo down a spiral road that lets you use treasure chests to jump down faster. Monster Arena. You're tasked with going to every single zone in the game to slap enemies with a special weapon that allows you to capture them. You can then fight these creatures whenever you like in the Monster Arena for a fee. And if you do a good enough job catching things, you'll even unlock fights with some special monsters that drop extremely useful loot. Cactuar Village The Cactuar Village is a desert area that sees you talk to a stone to gain hints on where to find lost cactuars. Once you find the cactuar in question, you complete a little red light green light game and end their lives. The airship. There are a bunch of codes you can find for the airship itself to unlock new areas. To do so, you need to learn all bad and just read the passwords that are scattered around Spira. For several others, you open the airship's map and just start clicking around randomly. Yes, really. I wasn't sure if I was going to list this as a mini game, but I like to be complete. Seven games. Eight if you count the chocobo races as two. None of them mandatory, but at least two of them are very beneficial. Now let me list the mini games in Final Fantasy X 2. There are more than seven. Or eight, even. Blitzball! It's back, but this time it's a manager game. You tell your peons to go play ball and they come back with a win or a loss. I hesitate to really call this a game since your input is so minimal. The Calm Lands in general. The Calm Lands is an area in the game that used to be calm, but now it isn't because capitalism happened. It has many mini games, all of which I personally ignored after trying them for a little bit because they're absolutely not mandatory, thank God. There's Lupine Dash, betting on a dog race, literally. Reptile Run, my favorite of the bunch, where you navigate through enemies on a grid. Sky Slots, which is... Slots. Feed the Monkey, where you gamble on how much the monkey can eat before it crashes the bird. And Gulf Force, shooting birds. Concert Ticket Sales. This one is non-repeatable. You go around trying to sell concert tickets for the highest possible price. That's it. Cactuar Village! It's back! This time we're finding the Cactuars, but not ending their lives. Their names are eerily similar to the Cactuar from Final Fantasy X, and that worries me. Did we end their parents? Who knows? I'm not going to ask them. The game you play after you find each Cactuar is so much worse than Red Light Green Light, though. It's just a series of flashing screens, and you have to shoot the right screen. It gives me eye strain because I'm old. Chocobo Ranch. We get to raise chocobos, which means you have to catch them first. When you find a chocobo, you have to throw food at them so they don't run away. Destroy the other enemies and then throw out food again to complete the capture. They're basically very feathery cats. They all have random level caps and you need several chocobos capable of reaching the maximum level of five to obtain all of the story progression. Once you have a chocobo, you just send it out to find items for you and if you do it right, they unlock new zones. 
Pick an L dig site. You're thrown into the desert where you dig for loot on a timer, but sometimes there's another person digging too and they steal your loot. You are not allowed to bury them in the sand and leave them there, so that's unfortunate. Meehan mystery. There's a mystery afoot on the Meehan high road and you need to figure out who the culprit is of the mystery. This one has some goofs and gags. I thought it was pretty funny. Gunner's Gauntlet. The title is pretty descriptive, actually. You run a gauntlet as Yuna, who uses her gun to fight incoming enemies, to collect points until the time runs out. Marriage Candidates. This minigame has you go all over the place every chapter of the game to ask various people whether or not they want to marry some dude in the calm lands they've never met. Calm lands advertising. On top of the actual minigames within the Calm Lands, there's also a minigame where you, like the Marriage Candidate quest, go around everywhere to promote the Calm Lands company you sided with. LeBlanc Massage. This is a very short, non-repeatable minigame where you play hot and cold while giving LeBlanc a massage. LeBlanc, who then moans sensually when you do it right. Yes, really. Lightning Rod Towers. There's a bunch of towers in a zone and your team is going to fix them. Each character has their own personal minigame to fix said towers. Yuna has Simon Says, Riku has Press the Button That Flashes on the Screen, and Pain technically also has Press the Button That Flashes on the Screen, but there's a bunch of decoys. This is so much harder than I'm making it sound because the speed of these games ramp up as you move from tower to tower, and Pain's minigame by the final tower broke me in half. I imagine this is easier on a smaller screen, but once again, I strain, I am old. Sphere Break. This game has basic math, so it's not my favorite game, but I still find it pretty fun. There's a bunch of coins with numbers on the playing field, and you have to click enough of them to create a number equal to or a multiple of the number in the center ball. You gain extra points depending on what coins you choose to click and how many you click to create the final number and you have a set amount of turns to use enough coins to win the match. Via Infinito. This one's on the edge in terms of calling it a minigame. I guess it's technically more of a side activity. It's a boss gauntlet, kind of. There are 100 levels in Via Infinito and every 20 levels you fight a boss while the random encounter enemies become harder each level too. Besaid Spheres. There's some spheres in Besaid Island that let you search around for some numbers and those numbers open up a secret area. While in that cave, you gather up a bunch of villagers to lead them out of the cave and that's that. Creature Creator. This one was only added during International for us and I introduced it earlier when talking about the magical mold monster. But outside of building yourself a powerful team of creatures, you can also see their stories, fiend tales, each time you capture a new creature, you'll be able to level it, generally about four levels, and once you do, you can release them again and see their story. Not all fiends have stories, but most do, and some fiends have entire story chains that eventually reward you with powerful opponents to find in the tournaments, also available in this mode. This is the most in-depth minigame in Final Fantasy X 2, and including it, we're looking at 16 minigames total. If we bunch up the Calm Lands minigames in one big side event. That's a lot of minigames. One might say too many minigames? I'll let you be the judge of that. All right, what's Spira doing after the permanent defeat of Sin? Party. Yeah, but after the party. Party harder. Okay, yes, I'm sure they'll party for a while, but I mean, when all the partying is over. Mini party? I feel like we're talking in circles. Just make everyone play little games all of the time. John, the world still has to function. Okay, fine. Rebuild Kilika. That's good. That's good. What else? Back to the mini parties. I'm summoning Sin back. From the first Final Fantasy until Final Fantasy IX, all of the Final Fantasy music has been composed by Nobuo Uematsu. Alone. Final Fantasy X was still composed by him, but he was aided by Masashi Hamauzu and Yunja Nakano. And for Final Fantasy X 2, he wasn't around. Those tracks were created by Noriko Matsueda and Takahito Eguchi. They'd worked on The Bouncer together before, and Matsueda had a single track in Chrono Trigger, as well as a handful of other successful titles under her belt. But otherwise, they were relatively fresh on the field in terms of name recognition, and they had to live up to Nobuo Uematsu's work. 
The soundtrack was always going to be different, but different doesn't mean bad. However, I do feel like the Final Fantasy X 2 soundtrack doesn't and couldn't do what the X soundtrack did. Not because I think the composers are bad at their job, but because of the way the story is structured. Both games open with a vocal piece. Final Fantasy X opens with Otherworld, which isn't just an absolute banger, but once you've played the game, you'll realize that the song doesn't just open the game. It introduces the basic premise of the story as well. Go on if you want it. An other world awaits you. Memories of it cloud your sight, fills your dreams, disturbs your slumber, lost your way a fallen night. One thousand years, you ready? Free me, pray to the faith, in the face of the light, feed me, fill me with sin and get ready to fight. The opening sequence aggressively pulls you into the game after Titus calmly walks into what should be a regular Blitzball game. Titus has questions and so do you. In contrast, Final Fantasy X 2 opens with real emotion. Real emotion doesn't talk about the game's story in general because it's less important than its main character, Yuna. Ten Two is mainly about her personal journey and the song reflects that. Her wish to move on, to change and be her own person. She struggles but her memories keep her going. It doesn't reveal much of what's to come but it gives you a good starting point on what to expect from this new Yuna for a returning Final Fantasy X crowd. These songs have a very similar purpose. The rest of the game is where the problem comes in. Final Fantasy X has a main story that sees you travel from place to place much like most Final Fantasy games. It's a journey and because of that, the music has a chance to travel with you. The zones that are meant to feel heavy, feel heavy. The zones that are meant to feel lighthearted, feel lighthearted. Because the game knows what you have and haven't seen. There's only one place you can go to progress the story, so they can adjust the music for it. Final Fantasy X 2 instead lets you choose where to go from the very beginning. In most Final Fantasy games, that ability isn't unlocked until much later. You'll get some way to traverse the sky and from that point forward, you can go back to previously visited locations. Final Fantasy X 2 operates from the idea that you've already explored Spira in X. So, from the very start, each zone will have their own little missions with their own little storylines that progress each chapter with five chapters in total. You could start in Xanarkand with an emotional touch, then switch to the Moonflow for some hilarity, to the Calmlands for minigame hijinks, then back to Macalania for more sad emotions. The tracks everywhere are still good, mind you, but everything feels somewhat directionless because the game's story is all over the place. There's too much a person can miss. A lot of zones are optional in any particular chapter too, which doesn't help. And I really do need to reiterate that this has nothing to do with the composers, as far as I'm concerned. Noriko Matsueda had worked on Bahamut Lagoon previously and mentioned specifically that it was important to her that the music got the players emotionally invested in the narrative. So she matched songs to in-game areas using that method. She also wants the music to tell a story. A Thousand Words, the second vocal performance, I think is wonderfully done and it makes me cry every time I get to that scene, purely because of the music. That doesn't mean I don't have any notes on the music itself though, I do. Overall, just like the story, the music is more upbeat in Final Fantasy X 2 that unfortunately leads to a lot of tracks sounding vaguely similar. Not all of them, of course. The song in the background right now is Ten Two's version of Guado Salam. Still a slower song, but compared to the X version, again, markedly more a beat. The difference between the composers is also pretty obvious. When you hear a track like Seymour's battle theme, it feels very old school Final Fantasy. You'll hear both Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy X 2 music in the background throughout this video and I'll mostly use my favorite ones. I'll show their titles in the video in case you want to listen to them yourself, but if all you know of Final Fantasy X 2 is upbeat pop music, let me at least highlight Yuna's Ballad, one of the most important pieces in the game. But I can also recommend you give Memory of Light Waves a listen. I 
actually have more to say about the music in general, but I'll dot that around some of the story discussion. And we are going to talk about the characters and the story now. Up until now, I've mostly thrown around reasonably light spoilers, but I'm going to absolutely demolish any chance you could have of avoiding important plot twists right now. That was your warning. Let's talk about the story of Final Fantasy X first. I'm going to do my best to run you through this quickly. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. As quickly as possible, anyway. And we're going to be chronological about it, so uh, let's lay out some important concepts first. Spira is the world this all takes place in. Summoners are people who can acquire aeons, creatures they summon in battle, by visiting temples that house faith statues that hold the soul of any particular aeon. Machina just means machine, Blitzball is underwater football, and Oran is the best character in the game. Okay, let's begin. Long, long ago, Spira was a world thriving through the magic of Machina. Machines powered cities that never slept. Two of the greatest cities of that time were Xanarkand and Bevel, and as great nations tend to do when there's two of them, they started a war. Xanarkand had powerful summoners, but Bevel had more powerful Machina, and Xanarkand was losing quickly. Unwilling to see his people fall, Yu Yevon, an exceptional summoner of Xanarkand, decided to use the remaining inhabitants of the city to create a giant faith statue. The faith is how summons are manifested, and the bigger the faith, the bigger and more powerful the summoning. So the people of Xanarkand died and became one giant aspect of the faith. Yu Yevon used this faith to summon a dream version of Xanarkand at its prime, and not just of the city, but of the people in it too. After doing so, he also created a massive aeon, the first sin, summoned purely from the faith of Xanarkand's people? From Pyreflies? Regardless, Sin is here. He intended to fight Bevel using it, but lost control entirely, and instead, Sin followed Yu Yevon's most base commands, destroy Machina cities. And so, Sin first turned on the real Xanarkand, destroying it utterly, before turning its rage on the rest of civilization, Bevel included. Eventually, Unaleska, the first High Summoner, sacrificed her husband to create a faith capable of calling forth the final Aeon. She died upon summoning it, but Sin was defeated for the first time. What she didn't know at the time was that Yu Yevon would take the final Aeon's body and use it to recreate Sin over a period of ten years. Time passes and Spira establishes a few things in the thousand years since Xanarkand fell and Sin appeared. Each time Sin is defeated, the world gets roughly ten years of peace called the Calm, while Sin is remaking itself with the final Aeon that last defeated it. Once Sin comes back, every time a large gathering of people or machina appear, Sin attacks it. The only big cities that still exist are Luka and Bevel, because they actively have large groups of people divert attention away from those cities. Luka is important because it's where the Blitzball Stadium is, and that's really the only entertainment left for the people in this world. And Bevel is important because it's the seat of Yevon's religion. Yes, you Yevon, the guy who summons Sin, has his own religion. Everyone at the top knows what's really going on with him, but everyone else in the world is told that we should just atone for our sins, ha, huh? of using Machina so much. And if we do, Sin will one day disappear for good. This is the world in which Braska, a priest of Yevon, grows up. Braska marries an Albed woman, causing him to be thrown out of the clergy and his wife to be disowned by her Albed family, because the Albed are a faction of people who still use Machina a lot. Sometime after their daughter, Yuna, was born, the wife travels back to her family to try and patch things up, but her airship is attacked by Sin and destroyed. Because of this, Braska vows to become a summoner and defeat Sin. After his training, he picks up Oran, a disgraced warrior monk who refused to marry the daughter of a high priest because he's simply too beautiful. 
He also picks up Jekt. Jekt, a dream person from Dream Xanarkand, had gone out to sea one day to hone his blitzball skills, and somehow he'd run into Sin. Sin somehow turns this dream person into something more than a dream, and transports the poor guy out of Dream Xanarkand and into the real world where he's immediately arrested, because he keeps blaspheming due to his complete ignorance of Spira and its customs surrounding Yevon and Sin. He's thrown in jail as a weird drunkard, which is where Braska and Oren pick him up. They go on their pilgrimage and eventually make it to Yunaleska, the first High Summoner. She's an unsent, of course, and she informs them that Braska will have to sacrifice one of his guardians, someone he has a deep bond with, to create the final Aeon using their soul. Braska is willing to do so, hoping that this time Sin might not come back, and Jack is willing to become the final Aeon because he'd realized that there was no way back to his own Xanarkand anymore. Oren was desperate to stop them from doing this, thinking it wouldn't change anything, but Jekt promises he'd figure something out to break the cycle, and asks Oren to look after his kid, Titus, for him. They defeat Sin, and Oren returns to Unaleska after the fact, where she informs him that Sin is eternal. There was no way to atone for their sins, it would always come back. Oren lashes out at her and is mortally wounded when she strikes back. Dying, he drags himself to relative safety and eventually makes it back to the outskirts of Bevel, seat of Yevon's power. There, he ran into Kamari, a disgraced Ronso, a lion people from the mountains. He begs Kamari to take Yuna, Braska's daughter, away from Bevel and to a little island called Besaid, where she could grow up peacefully. Kamari agreed and Oren dies then and there. However, because of the promises he made and the guilt he feels over his friends, his spirit remained tied to this world, causing him to become an unsent. A spirit that did not pass on peacefully, virtually indistinguishable from a regular person, much like Unaleska. They literally died mad about it and came back to collect. The two children of those last sacrificed to calm Sin, Yuna and Titus, grow up to become the main protagonists of Final Fantasy X. Titus grows up in Dream Xanarkand, where he becomes a star blitzball player, like his father, while Oron watches over him, and Yuna grows up in Besaid, training to become a summoner, like her dad, while Kimari watches over her alongside Waka and Lulu, two people who treat her like a little sister. This all comes to a head, when one day, Sin shows up in Dream Xanarkand, destroying the place, Oron orders Titus to follow him and they approach Sin together, Sin who is now using Jekt as its core. Jekt still has some semblance of control and came here purposefully to pick up Titus and Oron to bring them back to the real world, where he hoped his son might find a way to break the cycle. Titus is thus teleported directly into the ruins of Baj Temple, while Oron is nowhere to be found. Feeling completely lost, he's set upon by fiends on all sides, but gets rescued by a group of Albed. One of them is Riku, a future party member who stops the other Albed from killing him and instead they take him with them on their boat. The boat is basically a little tutorial section, at the end of which Sin attacks and drops Titus off in the ocean in front of Besaid Island this time. Here he runs into Waka, who is immediately confused by Titus's claims that he's from Xanarkand and he excuses it as the effects of getting too close to Sin. Titus, not wanting to rock the boat too much, plays along so he can learn what's going on. Waka takes him to the island's village, where we eventually barge into the temple where Yuna is performing her trial to become a fully-fledged summoner. Here we meet Lulu as well. Where Waka is a play-by-the-rules type of guy who loves blitzball, Lulu is a stern woman who prefers to keep everything logical. Kimari is around as well, and Yuna finally emerges victoriously with her first Aeon, Valfor. There's a little getting to know each other, but the next day, Yuna would start her pilgrimage. Every summoner needs guardians on said pilgrimage on account of all the monsters, and Yuna's guardians are Lulu, Waka, and Kimari. Titus also comes along in hopes of finding a way back home, and because Waka wants him to play blitzball in his team, the Besaid Aurochs. So they take a boat trip to their first stop, Kilika. 
During the boat ride, Yuna and Titus bond over the fact that she's the only person who believes him when he says he's from Xanarkand. Unfortunately, the bonding is interrupted by another attack from Sin, who is on his way to destroy Kilika, which he does successfully. With so many dead in Kilika, once they arrive, Yuna has to perform Ascending, a dance to guide the dead souls to the Far Plane, where they rest in peace. Otherwise, they might become monsters. Next day, we get some battles, some character development we'll get back to later, and Yuna collects another Aeon, Ifrit. They take the boat to Luka this time, where we're introduced to Maester Seymour and Maester Micah. Micah is the head honcho of the Church of Yevon, and Seymour is a power-hungry half-human half-guado who killed his own father to get ahead in life and saw his mother sacrifice herself to become Seymour's first Aeon when he was just a child. When a character has that much backstory, you can already tell he's going to be bad news. The Guado are another faction that don't get on with most people particularly well either, so that doesn't help. Skip ahead and the Blitzball games begin, but also Oren was spotted in the city, and also the Albed stationed here have plans to kidnap Yuna. Why? Because the Albed believe the whole sacrifice a summoner to sin every 10 years shtick is getting old and they'd rather fight sin some other way. They're kidnapping summoners to keep them safe. We also get a very charming scene where Titus teaches Yuna how to whistle. He tells her that if she ever needs him, all she needs to do is whistle. It's not working. Practice. Okay. Hey, use that if we get separate. Then I'll come running, okay? <laughs> well, guess we should just stick together then. Tell you can do it. Yes, sir. Yuna gets kidnapped while Waka's Blitzball team is playing, but she's successfully rescued and the Besaid Aurochs still have a game to finish. However, when the game's over, win or lose, the stadium is attacked by fiends and Auron finally enters the stadium. Seymour cleans up the wave of enemies eventually by summoning his mother, I mean his Aeon, Anima, and everyone gets to go back on the road of the pilgrimage. Except Oron explains to Titus that Sin is his dad and he joins the party, requesting that Titus is made an official guardian too and off they go again, right after this scene. <laughs> Traveling down the Meehen High Road, they're informed about Operation Meehen. The Crusaders, a group that does their best to fight Sin on their own, have teamed up with the Albed and their Machina and will attempt to lure Sin out to try and kill it with their Machina weapons. A problem because Yuna's party has to travel this way to their next temple and the road is closed. Luckily and shockingly, two members of Yevon are part of the operation, Seymour and Kinok, another maester. They let Yuna's party through and allow them to watch, but when Sin arrives, it turns into a disaster. The forces are decimated, the Machina destroyed, and our team is left to clean up some of the monsters that appear. For some reason, Seymour takes this time to allude to wanting to marry Yuna? Oh my god! I know! Oh my god! We should get married! I know! We should... What? 
Let's get married. Seymour, there are people that are dying. Well, I don't want to marry them, they're dead. Yes, yes, that's... Listen, can this wait? I killed my father. What? Nothing, nothing. Future wife. Aaron! We pick up another Aeon in the next temple, Ixion, then move on to the Moonflow, a rather lengthy river that the party crosses on a shoe puff, an elephant-like creature. Except while on the shoe puff, Yuna is grabbed by an Albed once again that, once defeated, turns out to be Riku. Riku who, just like the other Albed, just want to protect summoners. Specifically Yuna in this case, because Riku is her cousin. She joins the party as a guardian and we leave for Guado Salam, Seymour's seat of power, where they are invited to hang out with him so he can properly propose to Yuna. While considering his offer, they visit the Far Plain. Yes, Spira's Heaven is a place you can somewhat visit. There, if one thinks of a lost loved one hard enough, they manifest before you. They can't speak, they're just images, but it's a nice scene. However, upon exiting the Far Plain, the spirit of Seymour's father attempts to leave the Far Plain with them. Yuna sends him and upon disappearing, he drops a sphere. This game's version of a video recording. Yuna views the sphere in private and finds out Seymour killed his father. She intends to confront him, but he's already left Guado Salam, so the team leaves as well and crosses the Thunder Plains. The people they meet on the way are already excitedly talking about the upcoming wedding, which is very weird, but Yuna confides in them that she had decided to marry Seymour after all. Titus is upset because he started to develop feelings for Yuna and vice versa, but there's nothing he can do about it. So they travel forward to the Makalania Lake, where Seymour was headed to, and where another Aeon, Shiva, awaits. The Albed, led by Riku's brother, who is literally called brother, attempt and fail to kidnap Yuna again, and Waka finally realizes that Riku is an Albed, so he throws a fit about it before they move on to find Seymour in the temple. Yuna reveals that she really only sought him out to confront him about his crimes and convince him to turn himself in. In exchange, she would marry him. Seymour says, no thank you, which means he must be destroyed immediately, as you do. The Guado aren't too happy about his death, so they refuse to let Yuna send his spirit onwards and instead chase the group out of the temple and onto the frozen lake, which cracks under the attack of a monster. Somehow, everyone ends up under the lake in one piece and Yuna hasn't changed her mind about continuing her pilgrimage. They decide to travel to Bevel to explain the situation to Maester Micah. Surely, he would understand. Surely. It is then revealed that they are standing directly on top of Sin, who was hanging out under the Makalania temple to listen to the Faith's song, called the Hymn of Faith. When he starts moving again, everyone is thrown into the Bicanel Desert, where the Albed reside. Since they're a little lost anyway, Riku says she'll take them to the literal home of the Albed, called Home. Honestly, at least their names are descriptive, if they all promise not to tell anyone where it is. But when they get there, Home is under attack by Yevon and the Guado. This is the key moment in the story where Titus finally learns that Yuna will die if her pilgrimage is successful. It shakes him to his core and from then on, he and Riku are on the same team, thinking of some way to both defeat Sin and get Yuna out alive. Home falls, but they didn't find Yuna there. The Guado had already taken her to Bevel, where she was set to marry Seymour. Seymour, who was now an unsent. Yuna had agreed once again, this time because she wanted to try and send Seymour at the altar. In one of my favorite scenes in the game, our team escapes home using the airship Celsius. With that same airship, they beat up the Guardian of Bevel and crash the wedding by sliding down right in the middle of the ceremony.
and Seymour still marry, though, because Maester Micah threatens to kill her friends if she doesn't. Only for Seymour to order their deaths anyway after a world's most awkward kiss. So Yuna threatens to throw herself off the building if he doesn't let her friends go, but then she throws herself off the building anyway after they let her friends go. I'm sensing a pattern here. So everyone escapes, Yuna picks up Bevel's Aeon, Bahamut, and then they're immediately caught and tried for their crimes. Only the Ronso Maester seems bothered to hear about Seymour's murderous past because everyone else is extremely corrupt and dead. Micah reveals himself to be an unsent as well. They have a club, presumably. We get thrown in jail, escape, punch undead Seymour in the face after he announces that he wants to become Sin so he can kill literally everyone. And then we flee back to the Makalania woods where Yuna finally begins to waver. She has feelings for Titus and wants to stay with him and Titus wants to stay with her too, which leads to this Final Fantasy's vocal performance that is meant to shake one to the core. Every Final Fantasy needs one. Nine had Melody of Life, eight had Eyes on You, seven had One Winged Angel, and six had Kefka's Laugh. It's a very lovely scene, but by the end, Yuna still decides to continue her journey. So they travel on through the Calm Lands and to the sacred mountain that lies before Xanarkand, Mount Gagazet, home of the Ronso. The Ronso initially try to stop them, but because Yuna shows steadfastness and the party defeats two of their stronger warriors in combat, they allow us up and promise to halt our pursuers. Those pursuers are largely just Seymour who shows up again on the mountain top. We punch undead undead Seymour in the face once again and make our way to Xanarkand, where Titus finally finds out that his Xanarkand is nothing but a dream. And in that same vein, he too is just a dream. The spokesperson of the entire faith as a whole, Bahamut's faith, asks Titus to destroy Sin for good because they're tired of dreaming. They want to rest. But if Sin and Yu Yevon within him is permanently destroyed, ending the summoning, Titus would disappear alongside the rest of Dream Xanarkand. With this knowledge, they travel through the ruins of Xanarkand until they find Yunaleska, who explains the final Aeon to them. She also explains the sacrifice required and, when prompted by Yuna, the meaninglessness of the entire ordeal. Instead of sacrificing one of her beloved guardians to become the final Aeon, Yuna decides that enough is enough and they punch Yunaleska in the face, only to find Sin waiting outside, as if asking, well? The Celsius airship picks them up and the team devises a plan to lure Sin out of hiding. Ask the entire world to sing the hymn of the faith, because Sin seems to like it. But before we do so, we go tell Micah that we killed Yunaleska so we can give him a heart attack. He sucks, is why. That's awful. Uh, tragic. We tell the Faith of Bahamut what we're about to do, summon Sin with the Hymn of the Faith, Sin creates gigantic fissures in the planet that are never spoken of again for some reason, we punch him in the fins for a bit and then we fly directly into his mouth. Inside of his mouth, we find undead 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 Seymour, who we punch in the face for the final time as Yuna finally sends him properly. By all means, try. Further in, we find Jekt, Titus's father, still lucid for now. They have a little back and forth and Jekt transforms into his final Aeon form so they can defeat him. After an emotional farewell, they finally face and defeat Yu Yevon himself, ending Sin forever and ending the dreaming of the faith. The world is free from Sin at last, starting the eternal calm. The Aeons everywhere disappear. People cheer below as Yuna dances her sending dance for Yu Yevon inside of Sin. Unbeknownst to her, she is also sending Auron, who says his farewells quickly as is customary. Sin explodes into a million pyreflies around the airship and Titus feels himself fading. Yuna had realized what was about to happen, but there's nothing to be done about it. Titus fades into the same pyreflies as everything else and he leaps off the ship towards his father, Auron and Braska in the far plane.
Yuna holds a speech of unity after Sin's defeat, and after the credits have rolled, we see Titus surrounded by pyreflies, floating in the water. He stretches and swims up to the surface, smiling. That final scene returns in Final Fantasy X too, but there's a between movie as well called Eternal Calm, where Yuna practices holding her breath underwater. Everyone's moving on with their lives, and Spira has seen new factions springing up everywhere. Most importantly, New Yevon, led by Berylai, and the Youth League, led by Nuge, with the Machine faction, led by Gipple, in between, selling weapons to everyone. Everyone's asking for Yuna to choose a side, but she refuses, and instead, when Riku shows up with a sphere that shows someone who looks suspiciously like Titus, joins Riku and Pain, a new friend, in their sphere hunting business. Hunting for more clues about this man they saw in the first sphere. It's an introduction for Final Fantasy X too, basically. And I know we just went over the entire Final Fantasy X story, but we're going to do another one. Don't worry, this one is markedly shorter, as we're only going through the main story. What can I do for you? Final Fantasy X 2 opens with the Real Emotion concert. Yuna is singing her heart out, but the party is crashed by Riku and Pain because lo and behold, the singing Yuna is an imposter called LeBlanc. She had stolen Yuna's songstress dress sphere and the team wants it back. They punch LeBlanc in the face, retrieve the sphere, and the sphere seems to compel Yuna to dance for some reason. Yuna explains that they're sphere hunters now, and their next sphere is hiding in Gagazet. LeBlanc tries to beat them to the sphere, but they fail, and the sphere itself turns out to be less exciting than we'd hope. The next sphere we find on Besaid Island has even less to show, but at least we get to visit a pregnant Lulu, because she and Waka are together now. Xanarkand, meanwhile, has been turned into a tourist attraction, and the sphere we find here is broken in half. Kilika, the next stop, sounds more promising, and we meet Nuge there as well, leader of the Youth League a group that stands directly against the Old Order of Yevon. Both the Youth League and New Yevon, a reformed Yevon religion, are after the same sphere we're after. The sphere in question shows us the man who looks like Titus in front of a giant machina. Uh, let me explain this one quickly so you don't hear it out of order. The antagonist of this game is called Xu Yin. That's the guy who looks like Titus. Xu Yin was in love with Len, a songstress, and she's the one who Yuna's songstress dress sphere originally belonged to. So, yes, Yuna's songstress sphere is still a little haunted by Len. That's why she suddenly started dancing. Xu Yin and Len were alive during the Xanarkand Bavelian War, and Len, who was also a summoner, was called to battle. Xu Yin refused to let her go because he knew she would die, so he meant to activate Vegnagun, the machina you just saw in the sphere. Before he could activate the weapon, Len showed up to beg him to stop, and he runs for her, but as they embrace, they're shot by the soldiers that pursued Xu Yin here before. Xu Yin was so filled with rage that while he passed on, his feelings grew sentient. This sentient vengeance haunted a cave for a while and then possessed Nuj, shooting his friends and using his body to go after Vegnagon once again, now wishing to destroy Spira entirely. Okay, back to the main story. Yuna, falling asleep in her songstress sphere, now also has dreams that mirror Len's memories. Except instead of Len and Xu Yin, she dreams of her and Titus. One dream shows them both running away from soldiers until they find themselves before Vegnagun, where they are caught and shot. While we're away making friends with either the Youth League or New Yevon, LeBlanc burgles the Gullwing airship, so we steal a few uniforms and sneak into LeBlanc Chateau to give LeBlanc a back rub. Uh, there. Hey, so I don't think we've hit our minigame quota yet. How? The boss says we need more distractions. Is the boss a cat? How about a hot and cold type minigame? Sounds good, just make sure it's story relevant, okay? In one of the chateau's secret rooms, we find our stolen broken sphere, as well as the other half, and the full sphere just shows us Vegnagun sitting under Bevel in more detail, and even though we have no real reason to trust them, we're now teaming up with LeBlanc because we want the same thing. So off we go to Bevel to find answers, where we find that Bevel's faith statue has been ripped out, and the tunnel underneath leads to Vegnagun's surrounding machinery. We find our way to where Vegnagun was supposed to be, but instead find a dark aeon, Bahamut. Where Vegnagun was is nothing but another, larger, gaping hole. 
Suddenly, every temple starts spawning their respective Dark Aeon, and we go around punching them in the face. Each Faith Chamber now has the same hole as Bevel, instead of the Faith Statue. And Yuna falls into one after one of the Aeons explodes behind her. She falls directly into the far plane, where she wakes up wearing her songstress dress sphere, and Shuhin approaches her, thinking she's Len. They embrace, and Yuna's dress sphere reacts to Shuyin, but when Nuj suddenly yells for her to open her eyes, the illusion is broken. Yuna's dress sphere changes back to her original gunner outfit, and Shuyin turns out to be Baralai, merely possessed by Shuyin, and he leaves through a portal immediately. Both Nuj and Gipal are there, hand Yuna a sphere each to give to Pain, and leave through the portal Shuyin had left through as well. Yuna then finds herself alone in a now darkened far plane where, if done right, the spirit of Titus will whistle for her to follow, leading her out of the far plane safely. She explains what happened to the others and hands Pain the spheres, who explains that the four of them, Pain, Gipple, Nuge, and Barilai, were once a part of the same team, the Crimson Squad. But when they were sent on a mission to a cave that held Shuyin's vengeful spirit, they were driven mad and started killing each other. Meanwhile, with all the leaders missing, Spira is in turmoil, so the Gullwings decide to set up a concert to take everyone's mind off things. The audience is fighting amongst each other because they're from different factions, until Yuna shows up to sing one of Len's songs, A Thousand Words. Her songstress Dress Sphere reacts again, and she sings the song together with Len's spirit. Afterwards, they resolve to try and talk to Shuyin, to make him see that Len loved him and he should move on. We jump down one of the temple holes and fight even more dark aeons there until the faith of Bahamut shows up again, explaining that they tried to fight Shuyin and while trying to warn Yuna, they were dragged into the darkness. We fight our way through until we find ourselves in front of Vegnagan alongside Nuj. Possessed Barilai is playing the organ that controls Vegnagan. Nuj offers a plan that would see him sacrifice his own life, but Yuna doesn't agree in one of my favorite scenes in the game. I don't like your plan. It sucks. Yuna's plan is to punch Vegnagon in the face without anyone else dying, and that plan works. The shadow of Shuyin's feelings eventually appears, and Yuna, in her songstress dress sphere, pretends to be Len, telling him to rest. He sees through it though, so we punch him in the face too, until the real spirit of Len appears and they disappear together. The three leaders of the factions in Spira apologize for screwing everything up so incredibly hard, and the Gullwings fly off in their airship, content with the outcome. If you've done things right during the game, there is a follow-up scene after the credits too, where the final scene from Final Fantasy X continues, and Titus breaks through the water, returning to Besaid. The airship arrives and Yuna jumps out to embrace him as the entirety of Besaid has come out to cheer them on. If you've done literally everything perfectly, which requires multiple playthroughs, you get yet another scene of Yuna and Titus in Zanarkand, wondering if Titus is here to stay this time or if he's still a dream. Are you real? I think so. <laughs> You're back. I am back. I'm home. While Final Fantasy X and X-2 take place in the same world with a lot of the same characters, on the surface their stories are vastly different in many ways. But when you look at their themes, they complement each other very well. Final Fantasy X in its entirety is a story about loss, about letting go of old habits and outdated thoughts, about accepting the death and disappearance of loved ones. Xanarkand was always a dream, ever since the Machina War a thousand years ago. Titus and Jekt had always been dreams of the Faith. Spira operated the way it did now, not because it was the best way to do so, but because it refused to look for new solutions to their rather large, destructive, fishy problem. Both Yu Yevon and current day Spira decided that the past was preferable over an uncertain future. Yes, Xanarkand isn't real, but it's still there in a way. 
Yes, Sin comes back every few years, but at least it's gone for a while. Both are convenient lies. Unaleska is even completely straightforward about this. Sin is an inevitable part of Spira's destiny. It is never-ending. Never-ending? But... but... if we atone for our crimes, Sin will stop coming back, yeah? Someday it'll be gone, yeah? Will humanity ever attain such purity? <laughs> the Albed, and eventually for a while the Crusaders, attempt to destroy Sin using Machina, and this stepping outside the boundaries is frowned upon by society at large. It's seen as perpetuating the sin that created sin. Better to keep your head down, ask no questions. It's why the game constantly repeats that there are rules, that certain things simply go against the teachings. No one asks why, they just accept that this is the way. The cycle of death isn't broken until the faith themselves, those that dream of Xanarkand and the people in it, decide to let go of the past, decide to move on. They want to stop dreaming. The past is literally begging the present to let them go. Alongside Oren, who understands that this is a futile cycle that demands death and offers false hope. Together, they ask questions and defeat Yu Yevin, Sin, for good. In the process, as they each represent a facet of the past the world let go of, both Titus and Oron disappear. Titus because he was a dream of a world long gone, Oron because he died years ago, a reminder of Spira's cursed hope. The world is finally allowed to move on and grieve. Grieve the war that brought about a thousand years of destruction. It's a game about the pain of that loss, but also the necessity of moving on. Holding on to the past, to that pain, is in the end destructive. The ending is incredibly bittersweet. Never forget them. In that same vein, Final Fantasy X-2 is a story about Yuna coming to terms with her personal grief, loss and the passage of time, and how that affects her relationships as well as her self-worth. In a world without sin, having been the summoner to defeat the creature forever, she is noted purely as the High Summoner. She wants to be more than that. She wants to move on from that part of her past, to have the freedom to just be Yuna. On your journey through Spira, you come across its denizens and their ways of addressing this new stage of their lives too. How did they adapt? Did they adapt at all? In the meantime, we have the two biggest groups in Spira once again tearing each other apart. New Yevon, a group still stubbornly clinging to the religion of Yevon, the Youth League, a brash band determined to aggressively move forward without thinking things through too much. On top of that, we have the story of Xuyin and Len. Xuyin is quite literally the past coming back to haunt us. In helping him move on, Yuna completes her own journey of acceptance alongside him. Looking at the stories in this way, they're both essentially about change. Change for the better, even if it's sometimes painful, it is for the best. The problem, at least for me, comes in the way the stories are told, both gameplay and character-wise. Final Fantasy X starts with Titus. You see things from his perspective, learn as he learns. Because the game is built around a pilgrimage, it's a journey in the very literal sense. Emotions don't clash weirdly because the writers know what you're about to see, and how to build up scenes and eventual reveals. In Final Fantasy X II, because you're allowed so much freedom, that's never the case. And I don't even mean just the free travel. It's almost like they wrote the story, realized that they couldn't have you discover Spira anew because you've already done that, and suddenly it hit them that there wasn't enough content. So they added a lot of mini-games and gags. 10-2 is already shorter than 10 by about 15 hours according to how long to beat, 31 hours on average. But those 31 hours aren't all story. We go back to Besaid to hang out with a pregnant Lulu and Waka for a bit, there's several cutscenes of the girls just hanging out, being gals. 
there's an entire chapter that requires you to just look at calm spheres for some time. And yes, every chapter has so many mini games. Optional, mind you, but they're there. And there are some that you need to complete to get the perfect ending for each chapter. And this creates the added problem that this is a short Final Fantasy game. A short Final Fantasy game with a lot of mini games leaves very little time for one of the most important parts of a story. Character development. In Final Fantasy X, we gradually get to know the characters, learn some of their backstory and their mannerisms, why they are the way that they are, what motivates them and how the events of the game impact their worldview. Waka starts out as a warm-hearted guy, who you then find out is also a bit of a tosser when it comes to judging the Albed. Initially, you might wonder why that is, and you might also wonder where the nearest cliff to throw him off of is. Everyone dislikes Albed, but he's a raging jerk about it. But then you find out that this extreme hatred stems from the loss of his brother. Years ago, Waka's brother Chapu went off to fight Sin alongside the Crusaders. Waka gave him a sword to use in combat, but instead, Chapu opted to use the machina provided by the Albed. Chapu died, and Waka blames the Albed and their use of machina for getting his brother killed. While Sin might have dealt the killing blow, Waka, having grown up in a spira that condemns Machina as the reason for Sin's existence, feels the Albed are equally, if not more so, responsible for what happened to his brother. In time, as he gets to know Riku, other Albed, and learns of what's really going on, he changes his tune. After the Albed lose their home, Waka is the one who awkwardly tries to cheer Riku up. And Waka is just one example. Lulu seems stern and reserved, but we learn that she lost the first summoner she was guarding on her pilgrimage. And then she also lost Chapu, her lover, to sin. Lulu, perhaps more than anyone, has a lot of grief to process and you see her do so during the game, sometimes lashing out at Waka's optimism when he ponders if Chapu could still be alive somewhere. Oren starts out as the quiet, hard-boiled professional who's just here to get a job done, only for us to find out that in his youth, he was very much like Titus, even mirroring his exact reactions to finding out the truth about Sin. This is a team of seven characters, and each get their own small arc where they struggle with their changing world. Even Kimari, a stoic warrior who truly has very few lines, is so well characterized through the very few words and actions we do see of him. Kimari think Riku should stay Riku. Final Fantasy X 2 has a cast of three characters, but two of them we already know everything about, Yuna and Riku. Yuna is the focus of the narrative arc, but a lot of her story is told through voiceovers. You enter an area or a story beat happens and we hear Yuna's thoughts on the situation. There's a great deal less subtlety available in terms of expressions and actions. Titus had voiceovers in 10 as well, but in that case, it's often necessary because we're exploring the mysteries of Spira. And those voiceovers stop when Titus stops telling the story. Because that's how 10 opens. Listen to my story. This may be our last chance. We are genuinely listening to him tell the whole story, up until they arrive in Xanarkand. It's like he wrote us a diary to read through. Yuna's voiceovers, especially at the start, tend to open by describing the scene we're looking at. This is Pain. I look up to her as a sphere hunter, and also as a friend. If she were to also tell us a story, we wouldn't be able to see what she's talking about. She'd make for a terrible storyteller. That aside, the only main character that could have a new story to tell is Pain, and she does, but not a lot of it. Pain's story revolves around the group of guys that lead Spira's current factions, Berylai, Nuge, and Gipal. They were in a team called the Crimson Squad together, a team created by Kinok from Ten to investigate the cave that held Shuyin's evil spirit, the Den of Woe. Because the spirit was there, people who went there saw visions of Vegnagon and they went a little mad. Kinok, wanting to know what Vegnagon was all about, sent in the Crimson Squad under false pretenses to check it out. As expected, everyone went mad and they turned on each other. 
with Xu Yin eventually possessing Nuge and shooting everyone in the back. The possessed Nuge pulls himself together long enough to tend to their wounds, then leaves them with the owl bed and everyone scattered. That sounds like a pretty interesting story, but the way the game tells it is in bits and pieces by showing us Spheres of Pain's recordings during that time. There's precious little time otherwise spent on Pain and her friends. Because Nuge, Berylai and Gipple all lead factions of their own, we do get interactions with them, but we don't bond with them over the course of the game. That means they show up, do or say whatever they need to do or say to move the story along, and then they leave. They're not party members, we don't travel with them, we don't sit around a campfire with them, we don't see their reactions to various moments in our journey. They're empty vessels for the most part. There's one Crimson Sphere, the spheres that tell their story, that I really like. It's one where they all stand on the deck of a ship and they talk about their future, what they want to be. Payne wants to fly an airship, Gipple would be the engineer, and Barilai wants to navigate. They decide together that Nuge should be captain and then they have a laugh about it. It's a personal moment and one of the very few or even only ones we get. Otherwise, all we get is that Nuge is the strict grumpy one, Gipple is the goofy one, Barilai is the friendly open one, and Payne is the calm neutral one. Some of the spheres don't even make sense as they're related to Final Fantasy X. There are a few that show us what the three men are doing during that time. Apparently Gipple was in Bicanel when the Guado attacked home, chatting with Oren. Oren walked off after their chat and Gipple immediately ran for home, so why didn't we see him anywhere? You could argue home is big, so we just didn't run into each other, but if he escaped, which he must have, why didn't he link up with the other Albed? Us. That made it out alive. It's been established that he's friends with Riku and Sid is the Albed leader. Berylai apparently made a deal with Seymour to aid him. He'd wait in the shadows for the right time as Seymour mutters that he'll find a use for him. I, I guess I just don't understand why you'd spend time on cutscenes like that when you could, instead, give them cutscenes in the current day to build out their character. As it stands, Nuge gets a little extra in that we know he wants to die, and LeBlanc is in love with him. Although the latter is more LeBlanc's arc. What I'm trying to say is, I didn't really care very deeply about anyone in the story, except Yuna. We don't get enough time to learn anything substantial about anyone. Pain doesn't really have an arc, she doesn't change. She's a stoic warrior with a troubled past at the beginning of the game, and she still is by the end. Riku is more of an airhead in this installment than she was in 10, and by the end, she's still an airhead. I still love her, both because of what I know of her from 10 and because she's fun and upbeat, but she doesn't really get a story of her own. Yuna says she's going to be her own person at the start, and by the end she is. Which is my final problem, a lack of mystery. Well, we do need a new mystery for our next game. Ideas? What are the Moogles up to? What happens when you suplex a train? Mysterious ghost dress. Oh, that sounds interesting. Elaborate. Well, I figured we're going from uh, my dad is a giant killer fish possessed by God, so we need to keep it light. I agree, so ghost dress. Yeah, maybe there's a, another sad ghost uh, and they're in love with the ghost in our dress. You're making no sense at all. Yeah, I love it. Really, very good. So mysterious. In general, there was always going to be less mystery in a follow-up. We dropped into Final Fantasy X and had questions like, what is this world and why does Sin exist? Who was Chapu? What are High Summoners? Aeons, Yevon, or the Albed? What's going on with Oren? What happened to Jekt? Why is everyone so sad Yuna is trying to become a High Summoner in the first place? But now we know what Spira looks like. We know a great deal about its history, its people, the cities, and all its weird little quirks. Things that were new and exciting in 10 aren't anymore. The mystery has to come entirely from new characters and new story developments, but as said, the characters aren't really getting many arcs, and the story itself only really has one big mystery. Who is the man in the sphere? A side question is, of course, what's up with my dress sphere? But that's all, really. Vegnagon is barely a mystery because it's revealed so early. And the answers aren't necessarily groundbreaking either, because once again, we don't get to know much about either Xuyin or Len. Xuyin was a guy in love with Len who tried to save her and then he died. Now he's a ghost. 
Len was a songstress and a summoner, and then she died. Now she's in my dress. We don't get anything about their characters or their personal lives. The best we've got is Shuyin in a cage, and that's hardly backstory. Final Fantasy X's main antagonist, as far as we knew from the beginning, is Titus's dad. Throughout the game, we can find spheres of Jekt and the gang, and they're largely all very personal cutscenes where we learn a little more about their personality and their thoughts. We get flashbacks from Titus's point of view too, how he saw his dad. At the start, Titus hates his dad. He keeps talking about how much of a jerk he was, how his mother would ignore him when his dad was around, how he just disappeared one day, and he never got to tell him how much he hates him. Then, by the end of the game, when we confront him, Titus gets to tell him, face to face, that he hates him. You'll cry. You're gonna cry. You always cry. See? You're crying. <laughs> I hate you, Dad. Except, by that point, it no longer means I hate you. It means I love you. The final, final boss in the end is Yu Yevon, an oppressive force we've dealt with for the entirety of the game. Don't do this because Yevon says don't do it. Don't go there because Yevon says don't go there. Don't ask because Yevon says don't ask. In contrast, Final Fantasy X-2's final boss is a big machine. And then we punch the little man inside of it in the face. He showed up a few times to say hello, and that's it. And it's why the emotional impact isn't there as much as it was in 10. Not just because we've been bonding with our little party and their various types of trauma since forever, but also because the final fight means something personal. Final Fantasy X-2 literally blows up the world if you lose during the final fight, but somehow the stakes don't feel quite as high. And they do clearly want you to get emotionally invested with songs like A Thousand Words, but it just doesn't work as well, especially with how upbeat most of the gameplay is. How many died today? People die and Yuna dances. When will she stop dancing? When will it stop? Final Fantasy X was sad in a lot of ways. There were moments of levity, of course, you have to break up the emotion somewhere, but for the most part, it wasn't very happy. The Kilika sending, the Xanarkand attack, Operation Meehan, the attack on home, the twist, sorry, many twists at the end. Final Fantasy X came with a thin layer of veiled sorrow over almost every scene. Yes, even the laughing scene. A lot of people in spirit depend on us. I learned to practice smiling. When I'm feeling sad, you know. <laughs> I know it's hard. Yeah. I understand. I think. Right. Now let's see what you can do. Huh? Come on. Uh, uh. <laughs> this is weird. Next, try laughing out loud. What? Come on, show me. Ha 
probably shouldn't laugh anymore. This scene has been memed to death, of course, I even did it in this video, but while you're playing the game, it's actually very touching. In context, Titus has just found out that his father, Jekt, is Sin, and thus responsible for all the death and destruction Yuna and her party are trying to fix. At this point, Titus doesn't yet know that Yuna is going to die, so Yuna trying to cheer Titus up is very bittersweet and one of the reasons Titus likely feels so guilty when he does find out what's to happen to her. He didn't realize he was doing a version of telling a depressed person to just smile more. If they don't, and they get to Xanarkand, they might defeat Sin. Uni could... But then she... Uni will die, you know? You know, don't you? Summoner's journey to get the final Aeon. Yuna told you, didn't she? With the final Aeon, she can beat Sin. But then... But then... If she calls it, then the final Aeon's gonna kill her. Even if she defeats Sin, it will kill Yuni too, you know? For a good chunk of the game, Titus travels around not knowing that he was walking the same path as Yuna. Freeing Spira meant his death. He basically took over her role by the end, no longer sacrificing her but himself instead. If she had gone through with the final summoning, he would have continued living. The Faith would have kept dreaming. It emphasizes sacrifice as a theme. What does it mean to sacrifice? With how little time Final Fantasy X II gives its story and characters, it's impossible to have moments and themes play out fully. It doesn't get the time to breathe. And speaking of letting moments play out, before I give you my final thoughts, we have to talk about Last Mission. Last Mission is a giant minigame that picks up after Final Fantasy X II. I know, it's very on brand. I actually quite like this minigame. If you've ever played Final Fantasy XIV, it's a bit like Palace of the Dead. You pick one of the three girls to enter a tower filled with obstacles. Inside the tower are 80 floors and lots of enemies, but you don't fight using turn-based combat. You're on a grid and every action causes a turn to pass. Taking a step, attacking, using an item, everything takes a single turn. The enemies all move during that turn too, and the objective is to find the elevator to the next floor until you hit 80. You don't enter with anything but the clothes on your back, literally, just the character's standard dress sphere. Throughout the tower, you can find new dress spheres, and you can level up those dress spheres as well as your character to become stronger. There are also items that affect the floors or the enemies on it, putting everyone in the room to sleep or teleporting directly to the elevator. 
If you die anywhere in the tower, you get sent back to the start, but you do get to keep your character's level, just none of the items, unless you send them back to your storage somewhere along the way. I do think this game is enjoyed in short bursts more than long sittings, but like I said, I do like it. But it also comes with a little story, and if you think Final Fantasy X-2 gave their characters little room to breathe, this one tries to outdo even that. When you start up Last Mission, we see Yuna enter the stadium in Luka, three months after the end of Final Fantasy X-2, reminiscing about friendship. Riku shows up too, and eventually, Pain. They all received a letter to go to Utiser Tower and climb it. Once there, you'll get a new cutscene every 10 levels of the tower. The quick recap of that is, uh, Riku's a jerk now. She's, she's just the worst. And listen, I, I love Riku. Look, <laughs> my best friend from when I was a kid brought me this keychain home from Japan and I still have it. Riku was my favorite, but she's terrible in Last Mission. She doesn't know what she wants to do in life, so she just does everything all of the time. She works for everyone, on everything, everywhere, all day, every day. So she tells Yuna and Pain that they're lazy and they suck, in so many words. She's mad at Yuna for wanting to stay on Besaid, just hanging out with Titus. Pain eventually brings up that she's writing a book about their escapades and neither Riku nor Yuna are supportive in any way. And then, oh my god, just watch this scene. Look, I know I can't just sit around and do nothing. I can't stay still in one place. I have to keep busy. Not like you, Uni. Like me? Just passing all those days back on Besaid, wasting your time away. What do you mean, wasting? I'm not flying all over the place like you. But that's what I want right now. I don't get it. What is? To watch the ocean and go for walks and cook meals. But that's so normal, Uni. But I want normal. Why can't you understand that, Riku? I just can't. You're not doing anything with your life. And you're just fooling yourself by keeping busy all the time. What do you mean by that, huh? That's enough, both of you. To each her own. Let's just leave it at that. Well, I would leave it at that if she would just let me be. Huh, easy for you to say, Pain. You don't care about other people, just yourself. And you care about others too much! Well, I can't stand to see you wasting your life away! That's none of your business! I said that's enough! From then on, every interaction is awkward and cold. Also, Payne wrote the letter because she missed hanging out together, but now all they do is fight. They mention that they actually don't really know each other very well, and perhaps that's why they're fighting so much now. Perhaps the writers also felt they hadn't given them enough development during Final Fantasy X-2. When they eventually get to the top, it turns out it's a machine that doesn't work, but Payne thinks the view is still worth the trip. They think about their friendship and how they'll always have their memories, and then the machine does something? No one comments on it. I actually think the message is a good one, again. I like what it's trying to do. People change, the Spice Girls were wrong, sometimes friendship is not forever. And that's okay. You'll always have your memories. But because there's little time to really explore the concept, everyone just comes off as a jerk in the end, and their change of heart gives you whiplash. If they'd given it just a little more time, or sown the seeds of these ideas during 10-2, I think it could have been much more well-rounded. As it stands, I don't dislike this small story. I think it's very humanizing. We even get some of those scenes of the girls sitting around a literal campfire, just talking for a while. We see a little more of their personalities shine through, as well as their ideas of the future, and I really appreciate that. Having seen the last mission, you could even say that Riku's extremely upbeat personality simply comes from masking, pretending that everything's okay all the time, and the reason she's so much more peppy in Ten Two is because now that the protection of summoners is no longer an issue, she's drifting, with no idea what she's to do with her future. We can theorize on that having seen a little more of her as a person, as opposed to her as a character doing a bit. I really think there are some missed opportunities here that I'm sad they left on the table, so I don't necessarily think it's a bad addition. Like I said, I like the minigame aspect itself as well, despite some of its flaws, like not explaining certain mechanics very well or 
even at all, but I do think the cutscenes needed more focus, and I would have really appreciated it if they'd given them more time to breathe, which is my main complaint about the game in general. Final Fantasy X is my favorite Final Fantasy, because I love the story, I love the characters, and I love how many little things just work so well. See, Tekidane, isn't it wonderful? Coming back in Yuna's theme when, for most of the game, she tries her best to smile and make the world a better place for everyone in it, the smaller revelations along the way. At one point on the Mihen High Road, Titus walks over to Yuna, who is sitting down, watching the sunset. He asks her what she was doing, but she says she wasn't doing anything. Later on, near Zanarkand, a sphere falls from her pocket that shows us she was actually recording personal farewells to every single one of her guardians. The recording is interrupted when Titus starts walking over. The fact that every single temple has their own version of the Hymn of Faith, sung by the one sacrificed to create the Aeon House there. Final Fantasy X-2's story, on the other hand, feels a little bit rushed in its handling. A lot of the characters from X that show up here were turned into clowns a little bit. Especially Sid and Brother. They're not especially serious characters in X, but in X2, they are truly clown levels of idiot. Brother developed the weirdest, biggest crush on Yuna, his cousin, and he's not shy about it. During the final scene between Len and Shuyin, she opens with, Hi there. Hi there. Huh. And the entire scene just has Shuyin blankly staring at her crotch. The ending is also a little strange, and I say that as someone who likes happy endings and who does like that Titus can come back. And while I don't necessarily agree with Ten's writer that a happier story was a bad idea, I do think there's something to be said for it, because Final Fantasy X's ending left the door open but didn't kick it down. There's the final scene, of course, where Titus wakes up in the water and swims up. That can be interpreted in several ways, but the faith actually leaves it in the middle even more. Near the end of the game, after you've spoken to Bahamut's faith in Bevel, you can return to the previous temples as well, and the faith there will give you a unique conversation. There are three in particular I want to touch on. Should the dreaming end, you too will disappear. Fade into spirit sea, spirit sky. But do not weep, nor rise in anger. Even we were once human. That is why we must dream. Let us summon a sea in a new dream world. A new sea for you to swim. Sin swam in the sea near Xanarkand. Perhaps the waking dream eased its suffering. Your father touched Sin and became real that night, foundering in the seas of Spira. You are a fading dream, but one touched by reality. Spira will not forget its reality, nor the one who saved it. Run, dream, run on. Pass beyond the waking and walk into the daylight. Each of these sentences can throw the ending in a completely different direction. Shiva implies that the water at the end is simply a new dream realm created by the faith for Titus. Perhaps one where they also dreamt up a Yuna to live by his side. Ifrit implies that Jekt became real upon touching Sin, so that would mean Titus did too. If he was more than a dream at that point, did he truly fade away completely? Yojimbo implies that he is still a dream, but not entirely. If he wills it, he can become real and return. They leave it up to us how hopeful we want that ending to be. Final Fantasy X-2 doesn't give you the option in canon anymore. Titus comes back. I'm not mad enough to write a book about it where Titus gets his head turned into a volleyball so he can get recreated by a god as a ghost person who lives on borrowed time, but I can see how it would be frustrating for the original writer. More to the point, Tentu's story about Yuna's journey seems to focus on Yuna growing as a person, accepting change, accepting grief as a part of her life, and finding peace in knowing she'll always have her memories. With Titus coming back, it doesn't negate her progress, but it does make the story somewhat less impactful. But even beyond that, Yuna seems to have had her character progress reset somewhat. 
Final Fantasy X showed us a Yuna that very clearly wasn't a pushover. Quite the opposite. She chose to die for the good of Spira, not deterred even by all the terrible things that happened during their travel. It's mentioned specifically that her strength of will is impressive. Then, in Final Fantasy X 2, there's a running joke that Yuna is a pushover. She'll just do whatever people ask of her, no questions asked. That complete character flip is jarring, especially if you play the two games back to back. If you play Last Mission on top of that, you have Riku, the warm-hearted character whose only objective in Ten was to protect Yuna, to keep her safe. She wasn't childish per se, she was idealistic and hopeful. In Ten Two, she's a total airhead, and in Last Mission, she's a brat who doesn't support her friends. These are problems, still, caused in good part because we don't get enough quality time with each of the characters. Yuna is doing the majority of the talking, all of the voiceovers, the exposition, so because the tone of the game otherwise is very upbeat, every character just feels like a more upbeat version of their Final Fantasy X counterpart. The only exception is pain. So if I have so many problems with the story and characters, why do I still like this game? Very simple. Because I don't really see it as a Final Fantasy game an sich. You know how Final Fantasy XV is mostly just a the boys going out camping installment? Final Fantasy X 2 is mostly a the girls going out camping installment. They're even very similar in length. Hell, XV's main story is shorter. The emotional parts of the story are almost an afterthought. We're here to have a good time hanging out with the girls until Titus shows up and then we give him a big hug and move on with our lives. Hi, it's me, the Intermission Chocobo. I just thought I'd make a little intermission cut here to make sure that you know that I do really like the story anyway, even though it's not the most important thing in the game. It's not. The thing is, Vegna Gun just doesn't seem that threatening because you don't really see the damage that it does. It's just kind of there. Unlike Sin, who you constantly see uh, uh, doing the unaliving of a lot of people. So I do like the story, I just wouldn't recommend Ten Two specifically for the story. I'd recommend it because I think it's fun. Okay, continue, carry on. RPGs and JRPGs in general are often very long. Because they're very long, you get to build a personal bond with all of the characters. Not just because you see their stories unfold, but also because you, personally, get attached to the characters. I played Persona 5 a long while ago now, but when I hear the coffee shop music, I always feel oddly calm and happy, because it sounds like home. If you've played Final Fantasy X though, you're already attached to a lot of these characters, at least I was, so I was just happy to see them again, to walk through the world of X again, see what everyone's up to, hang out in a rebuilt Kilika. And it is harder to do the extremely JRPG type twists in a game with a shorter story like this. There weren't any, it was you, moments to be had, but that's okay. Because I'm going to controversially say, I think Final Fantasy X-2's gameplay is better than X's. Except for Blitzball, we don't talk about that. There were some mini-games I enjoyed, like the Gunner's Gauntlet, and I liked seeing all the little fiend stories in the fiend creator. Ten Two also has New Game Plus, and I did think it was hilarious to go through the game fighting everyone with Almighty Shinra and a mushroom, while my girls stayed comfortably at level 1. Yes, thank you for asking. Also, once again, I really liked when Yuna told Nuge his plan sucked. I don't like your plan. It sucks. And even though the story didn't have the emotional beats of Ten, it did still make me cry on several occasions, especially whenever Yuna's theme started playing, or, of course, a thousand words. Personally, I got emotional every time Titus showed up and whistled to save Yuna to get her out of sticky situations. She could still rely on him. I'm not saying the only good Final Fantasy is a Final Fantasy that makes you cry, but... I mean, a little? The music really is very good in many places. Final Fantasy X-2 isn't like most other Final Fantasies, or even like most other JRPGs. And that's okay. You get to punch Maester Micah in the face repeatedly in the Fiend Arena, and that's worth something. That guy sucked. Keenock also sucked, but you only get to punch him once. For Auron's sake, we go easy on him. X-2, for the most part, is just silly fun. What, that's not allowed? Another day, another Final Fantasy. Another trauma, am I right? <laughs> You're so funny.
funny, John. All right, let's come up with some fresh trauma then, eh? Actually... Oh, God, not you. Well, I was thinking... Stop it. Maybe we could let some of the characters be happy? Boo! Boo! Nobody gains any new trauma, they just overcome their old trauma? Get out! Boo! Disgusting. If we don't have another Aerith situation by lunch, I will suplex a train. Honestly, I'd almost call 10-2 a slice-of-life game, and because someone's going to bring it up, yes, it's girly. Last Mission has accessories like magical lip gloss, but I don't think girly should be a negative thing. At the time this game released, it garnered largely positive reviews from the video game press, but there was backlash from the fans. I risked my very own mental health to read some of those old reviews, and yes, a fair share of them mentioned that the game was too girly as a downside. The strange thing is, you never hear anyone find that a game is too manly. Geralt growling his lines doesn't offend anyone. Kratos' beard never upset a soul, except most gods. Being girly isn't bad, it just might not be for you, and that's okay. It doesn't make the game bad. And hey, if you don't like the extremely cool magical girl transformations, you can even turn those off after the first time. But also, this game has magical girl transformations, and I think that's really cool. One thing I will add is that a lot of Tentu's conversations add jokes, and you can't really argue about your sense of humor. A lot of these jokes boil down to someone making awkward expressions or movements, and someone pointing out that they're being awkward. If you don't find the Tentu humor funny, then they're going to get grating pretty quickly. Bear that in mind if you do decide to give the game a try. And while we're on that topic, the PC remaster is a little broken in places. Sometimes the memory will simply run out during the cutscenes, turning your entire screen green with just a voiceover. I linked a patch for the PC version in the description to fix that problem, so all you have to do at that point is ignore Lulu's overdrive while you're playing 10, because that's broken on PC too. Obviously, I think both games are worth playing, each for different reasons. Final Fantasy X being my favorite Final Fantasy, X-2 being the reason I ever got interested in cosplay at all. And even if you haven't played 10 and you aren't fully attached to the world, I think you can have a good time playing. Just try not to take everything too seriously and enjoy the shorter, more lighthearted slice of life with a happy ending. I know 10 2 isn't going to vibe with everyone. Maybe it's not your type of humor. Maybe you play JRPGs for that deep, cutting story that hurts you deep in your soul like 10 did. Maybe mini games ran over your favorite console when you were a kid. But I hope you'll at least give it a fair chance instead of outright dismissing it as too girly. Not every Final Fantasy can be heartbreaking. Remember, change is difficult and sometimes it hurts, but it is necessary. Thank you very much for watching today, and an extra thank you to my Kofi cats and patrons who make my videos possible each month, or sometimes every two months. And an extra special thank you on top of that to specifically Adrian Peckel, Captain Danvers, Ray Ray, Wall Guy the Robin, Robertson, I Save One, Laser, MJ Coolsta, One's the Loneliest, and Septic. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing and leaving a comment, telling me how wrong I probably am, until another tale finds us. It's time.